Hi, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at procedurally generating colors. So we're gonna do a little series on the channel where we're gonna take multiple looks at color and some different approaches, basically some that are more random and some that are a little bit more controlled and even where we're kind of pre-authoring color palettes using procedural tools. So in this first video, we're gonna look at the completely random approach. Let's check it out. So I have here a little scene where we have our robot floating in midair. If we enter play mode, what we'll see is that we're procedurally generating in a grid of houses. I'm using these 3D house assets from Kenny. Uh, I'll put a link in the description below. I use the same ones for my uh, imaginary cities, procedural city generation series. Here we're just spawning a grid of houses. We've got, uh, in fact, I'm using the same house for each one and we're just applying random colors. If we hit the space bar, I've added a little scene reloader script to this and this is in the repository as well. You can grab the link to the source code in the description below. But as you can see, right, we're going through and we're getting this kind of completely random array of colors. I like to call it rainbow puke. You know, it can be useful in some situations, but we're getting a lot of oh, this brown here is like not so beautiful. We're getting a fair number of grays and there's no real kind of color cohesion happening here. In a later video, we're gonna look at how we can make things a little bit more cohesive, but as a starting point, this can be pretty useful when you wanna just generate some truly random colors. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. Okay, so if we look at our house random color here, it's got this random colored material script attached to it. We can see it's got a public field, which is an array of renderers. So what we're doing is we're looping through all of the renderers for this prefab. We're actually setting a new material, which we're generating a color for. So let's take a look at the code. So if we double click to open our random colored material script in Visual Studio, we can see that we have in start, we're generating a new color using this random color HSV method. Now I'm using it with no arguments, which means it's just gonna return a purely random color, right? There's, I'm putting no constraints on it. What you'll see below is that we've got commented out a few other overrides for the method. So one which takes in a hue minimum and a hue maximum, right? So the hue refers to the kind of outer ring of the color wheel. If we look and re-enter play mode, we can see now that we're actually constrained to a certain part of the color wheel. In fact, this is half of the color wheel, right? So if we look at, here's our standard material that's being applied. If we pull the color picker on screen, we can see that we're kind of being constrained I think it's to this half, this upper half of the color wheel, right? So we've got some greens, yellows, and reds, but we have basically no significant blues or pinks or magentas appearing here. So already, actually, this looks, we can see some things kind of getting into that blue, teal, aqua spectrum, but this already looks quite a bit more cohesive, it's still not great, but it's a little more dialed in. And this is something that I think is a useful thing as we start to learn about color, right? A lot of the time, less is more. Narrowing in, dialing in, we can get some better results by using a smaller palette of colors. So if we continue, let's try our next override, in which case we're picking from half of the color wheel by setting a hue minimum and a hue maximum. And now we're also limiting our saturation. So this will be zero saturation will be white and half of the maximum saturation. We can think of this as how vibrant or vivid the color is. And this is the, the S in our HSV, right? Hue, saturation, and value. That's the color model that we're working in here. So let's save that, jump back over to Unity. So now we can see everything is much more muted, right? And again, I would say, depending on the type of game that you're trying to make, this looks a little more depressing, right? But it also looks more kind of coherent in terms of color, right? This is not, we don't have these eye-popping colors 
randomly jumping out. This looks like it could actually be some kind of town here in Northern Europe where I live, where they love their drab colors. Shout out to you, Northern Europe, I love you. We could also go the other way. If we jump back in, we could say, actually, we only want the most saturated. Maybe we'll go from 0.4 to one. We only want the most saturated colors, right? And let's also maybe, let's say we take just a narrower part of the color wheel, right? Just a quarter of the color wheel. This is kind of interesting, right? Again, I actually think this looks less good it's more vibrant, but it's having that heavy mix of saturated colors, having lots of very saturated colors, I think is a little hard on the eyes, right? But we can see, right, we've got some more popping colors here. We just got a narrower range of the color spectrum. And I don't think this looks that great, but it's at least a little bit more constrained and cohesive. So let's jump back into Visual Studio. And so what we can see down here is we have this apply material method, right? Where we're taking our new color that we generated, right? Using random color HSV. And I should mention there's a fourth uh, overload. If we just look, here's the documentation before we move on. We can take in hue minimum, hue maximum, saturation, value, right? Value refers to the brightness, how bright or dark is this color that we're working with. And then we can also take in alpha if we're working with transparent materials, right? So we're not doing that here, so I'm leaving it out. But these are the various overloads that we have to work with. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can check them out and they're linked there on the documentation. I'll put a link to that documentation page in the, uh, in the description box for the video. So what we're doing, right, once we've generated our color is we are gonna apply that using a new material. You could have this link to a material asset, which would then reflect changes to everything that was referencing that asset, right? But in our case, we want to actually generate new materials at runtime so that we can have unique colors for lots of different things. So what we're doing here in our apply material method is we have, we take in a color argument for the function and we take in an integer, which is the target material index. So the target material index is in objects, actually like our houses that have multiple renderers, which renderer are we setting? We could probably make this a little bit better. I'm just passing in a hard coded value. That's not really the point of the tutorial, but just so you know, on multi material objects, you can pick which uh, material you want to target. In this case, we're targeting uh, material zero. Then here we are declaring a new variable of the type material called generated material. And then we are setting it to equal a new material and we're using shader.find to find the standard shader. So I'm using Unity's built-in render pipeline, right? We're using the standard shader. This does work in HDRP. In my uh, ProcJam project, Artbot Garden, I did this with HDRP materials. Uh, so it does work with that. I haven't tried it with Universal, but I'm pretty sure it works there too. I mean, I'm very sure, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're on the generated material, we're calling the set color method, and we're passing in a string, which is the keyword for the parameter in the shader. You can look these up if you're not sure what it is for a given shader, what color or what parameter of any type you're trying to target, you're going to pass it in as a string. It usually starts with an underscore. And in this case, for the standard shader, it's just color, that's the albedo color. And then I'm gonna pass in the color that we, that we passed in as an argument, right? Which is our generated color. Finally, we're just gonna loop over all of the renderers that we've dragged in in the inspector and say, set that renderer's material to our generated material. We're gonna go over each object that we want to set a material on and we're actually going to apply that new generated material that we've created with our random color. So as you can see, right, this gives us a good amount of control over generating our random color schemes, but we still are not getting anything that feels really cohesive or really informed by any kind of artistic intent, in my opinion, debatable, right? So what we're going to do in the upcoming videos in the series is we're gonna look at generating colors that have a relationship to each other based on 
color theory or my very limited understanding of color theory, right? That's a big topic. We're gonna use some basic color theory to generate some palettes that kind of work with each other. So those will be coming out in the coming weeks. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing. Drop me a comment down below. What do you think about this? Would you use this? Do you think that generating random colors is something useful? Could you think of some kind of cool creative ways to use it? I'd love to hear from you. Drop a like on the video. That always helps people to discover the content and spread the word about the stuff that I'm doing. I, I really appreciate your help in that regard. And then the last thing is, what do you think of my new filming setup, right? I adjusted it a little bit from last time. I'm kind of playing around with the format. I actually think this one is pretty good. It's also kind of easy for me because I can keep it set up. So we'll see. I'll maybe try a few more videos in this format. Give me some feedback down below if you have an opinion about about it. I'm trying to make the content better for you guys. And as always, thanks so much for uh, spending a little bit of time with me and I will see you next time. Bye.